Good evening, I'm Laurie Johnson. Welcome to Houston Public Media's new web series, Political Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by show commentators Jay Iyer and Brandon Roddinghouse to discuss all things political. Tonight, we'll continue the conversation from Red, White and Blue about a divided United States Congress. So let's get started. Jay and Brandon, what is the state of the Congress right now? Is it as bad as kind of the media is making it out to be? Well, we used the term goat rope earlier as a, uh, as a moderating way of talking about it. Things are pretty grim. I mean, you've got the distance dis 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 ideologically between the Republicans and Democrats as high as it's been. You've got distance between the chambers, between the House and the Senate, as great as it's been in, since the Civil War. So it's not surprising that things go don't get done. We can find leadership as a way to make that happen, but the fact is that there's such ideological divides, and the way in which these issues are pitched now to voters, it makes it hard for them to find compromise. So a lot of problems to be overcome in a very narrow way and perhaps in very sort of small segments. Right, I mean, I think part of the problem is that the primary electorates really dominate the districts. Because of redistricting we've had over the last few years, you've had more and more districts that are sort of packed in with, part from a partisan perspective. So what you're seeing is, is that, that, to Brandon's point, the distance between right and left is much greater than it used to be. And even within the re individual caucuses, the Republican caucus, you, you tend to be dominated by much more conservative members and the Democratic caucus, for that matter, by much more progressive and liberal members. So you're not able to get a con consensus. And what you're seeing uh, in the House right now is that moderate Republicans or even traditional mainline conservative Republicans are having a hard time because of, I think, to some extent, sort of the intransigence of, of, uh, of, of, a, of a caucus, part of the Republican caucus that doesn't want to really compromise. So, I mean, doesn't this kind of reflect, though, what's going on in the American public, the increasing polarization? Right. Uh, we see this happening, you know, not just yeah. in elected officials. So yeah. how do you, if, if that's the case, and if we're increasingly divided just among us, why would we expect anything different to be happening in Congress? Yeah. It's a chicken and the egg problem, right? What's causing what? Most scholars look at this and say that it's largely sort of sorting at the at the partisan level, at the local level, that's driving some of the um, some of the members of Congress to become more conservative. But that's driven in part by activists. So you've got elites that are polarizing. They're taking two different, very strong positions on policies. Almost every policy, even the ones that are consensual in some ways, and that's driving voters to be much more rapidly devoted to their party. And that's, of course, electing individuals in those parties who are much more extreme so it starts at the local level and I think you know in breaking the cycle it requires voters to think ahead and to be able to understand where things are and to look at the big picture about what the issues are and where they sit in terms of their their partisan predilections right I mean, and you're seeing it also played out even on the presidential cycle right on, on the on both primaries non-traditional candidates con candidates that are that are outside uh, sort of conventional politics are, are blossoming, whether on the Republican side, whether it's Donald Trump or Dr. Ben Carson or even Carly Fiorina, they're outsiders and, and, and really more, probably more conservative than maybe you've traditionally seen. Mm -hmm. um, for a party that has traditionally been one where they, they tend to nominate the establishment, over half the preference, so if you look at the polling, over 50% of the vote is, is geared towards a non-traditional candidate how it plays itself out in Congress is that you're seeing sort of outsiders yeah. really sort of pushing the issue um, and trying to trying to, to dominate the process. And so you have this, this, this constant battle going on. There's a way, I mean, giving people bipartisan solutions is meaningful. And when you expose people to areas of agreement between the executive and the members of Congress, mm -hmm. they do find that you can find a common ground and people are willing to moderate their position. So there's experimental evidence to show that in fact there is a way for people to become more like-minded from their neighbor who doesn't represent the same right. political party. So there's there's ways to make that happen, but leaders have got to find a way to build a bridge and you know swallow right. hard and you know shake a hand across the aisle. But the problem is is that you're you're punished effectively if you work with the other side, mm -hmm. and that goes that goes to both sides. And for example, I mean, if you're a, if you're a Republican and you and you decide to support something that the president has put out, yeah. you're, you know, you could find yourself getting a primary opponent. If you're a Democrat yeah. and you're willing to go along, you know, if you're, you're a Joe Manchin or something like that in the Senate, if you're willing to go along with some Republican initiatives. Um, you, you, yeah. you could find yourself getting primaried on the other side. So the partisan the partisan aspect has gotten so so divisive that it's hard to create common ground. Yeah. 
So th we talk a lot about this happening, especially in the Republican Party, and it mm. seems to be what we see visibly most right now. Is it also happening on the Democratic side? It definitely is. You know, they're in the same position where the, most of the voters are gravitating towards more liberal positions. The coalition of the Democratic Party is becoming younger and more ethnically diverse, so that's changing the dynamics of the individuals who are running. I don't think it's as bad in the Democratic caucus as it is in the Republican caucus, but you do see a kind of polarization there as well, and that's causing the same issue. You've got the, the fact that you've got movement in the polar opposite directions is creating friction. Even if it's just a little bit, it's enough to be able to not get you the number of votes you need to be able to sustain majority majorities and to be able to bring things up to passage. So this, even a little bit, is pretty meaningful. Right. I mean, the center basically doesn't exist at the House level. So you've created congressional districts that are really designed for, for one party rule. So everything is at the primary level. And at, at the primary level, you're dealing with sort of a, at, on the Democratic side, the most left or progressive candidates winning uh, just as you do on, on, on the conservative side. Now, to, 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 to what Brandon said, that hasn't been as much of an issue on the Democratic side um, because of the way their caucus is designed, but you just don't have the center, centrist Democrats anymore. The concept of, of even what Bill Clinton did in, 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 in the 90s of sort of running as a new Democrat just doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, the most conservative Democrats are still, relatively speaking, pretty progressive. Yeah. Jay's right. In one of the best predictors of more institutional gridlock is the lack of moderates. So as the parties become mm -hmm. more heterogeneous, you've got more different uh, sort of issue. Uh, you've got less heterogeneous. You've got less people who are in the middle who can kind of build a bridge. So lack of moderates in both parties is creating this serious sort of friction between the institutions. So wasn't the creation and the movement of the Tea Party sort of supposed to be a third party addition to Congress that would help uh, resolve some of the isu issues like this and then it sort of, I guess, sort of backfired on the Republicans in a way because yeah. you end right. up being gridlocked. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, the, you've, you've essentially sort of unleashed forces that you can't control. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there was sort of an anti-government, anti-Washington fervor that, that sort of drew, uh, drew their, uh, uh, their creation, but now you're stuck with them in, in power and they don't want to govern. I mean, yeah. structurally, their job is to effectively to oppose and not to govern, and that's really where the tension is. You've got a faction among Republicans that want to uh, look at compromise, right, that, uh, and, and, and want, to, want to move things along, um, whether, whether, uh, whether as, as fully as I think most conservatives would want, and you've got a faction that basically says, look, if we can't get what we want, let's shut it down, yeah. and that's effectively what the, what the dilemma is right now. Jay's right, and this creates two problems. One is, who's going to be a leader of this group, right? The Republican caucus has got effectively two major wings. So we see now in Congress, in the House, the question about who's going to be speaker, right? The kind of moderate choice, who's the consensus candidate, ends up l dropping out, and the l options beyond that tend to be much more conservative. So if they're in charge of that, then they're going to make some choices that are going to be very tough for moderate Republicans to have to go back and defend. The same is true in the Senate. Mitch McConnell's in a mm -hmm. position where he has to defend some of the people who are moderates, right? In Illinois, you've got Senate races, you've got Senate race in Alaska, you've got Senate races in Maine, and these are individuals who are potentially on the verge of losing their seat if the party pushes too far and those votes have to be taken. So this creates an impetus here for them, the leadership, to be much more likely to try to find a way to manage the internal division in the party. So what's the solution to this polarization? I mean, how do we get from here to a Congress that can work together again. Well, yeah, there's two there's two schools of thought here. One is the Senate, kind of because of the nature of the way they're structured, sort of l tends to, to to try to meet in the middle. And you have actual changes of leadership in terms of Democrat versus Republican because they're structurally they're, there's a lot more competition. In the House, I think uh, uh, Congressman Joaquin Castro mm -hmm. from San Antonio really has probably one of the more intriguing ideas. Um, and that's the idea of kind of a bipartisan speaker. So the way, th basically adopting the format and style that we have in the Texas legislature, which is the entire body votes for him, and it's not just dominated by one caucus. So here in Texas, we have, uh, we have Speaker Strauss, who, is, who, is, who initially became speaker, really with the support of all Democrats and a, and a smaller minority of Republicans, um, and has now sort of been able to do it. So you, it builds in consensus to some extent, I'm not entirely sure if that's workable 
in the Washington system? I mean, system? is that even possible right yeah. now when you have this divide right. that everybody could come together and rally behind one person? Yeah. Yeah. I think that Jay is right. If you create the impetus at the leadership level in Congress, then the voters are sort of forced to make those kinds of choices. And they may vote some of the people out who are the ones who sort of pirate themselves into a mm -hmm. different, different party or who are voting for a speaker who is the consensus speaker. But if you had a speaker who was elected by both Democrats and Republicans, and you have the filibuster rule in the Senate, I think that provides you with enough moderation to be able to find some bipartisan consensus on legislation and possibly move the ball forward. A big problem here is not just what gets produced, but what isn't even talked about. So big issues like immigration, big issues like funding for science and medical technology, which was cut during the sequester, issues involving transportation, these are all things that are off the table because they're not even at the point where they can sit down together and look each other in the yeah. eye. So even talking about the issues and getting leadership to make that connection is going to be a good step forward. Okay. Well, thank you so much for watching this evening. Remember to log on to HoustonPublicMedia.org slash perspectives every Friday night at 8 p.m. following the 730 broadcast of Red, White, and Blue. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you again next week. Good night.